Hello, my name is Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Thank you for attending Reevaluating the Impact of the Conquest of Mexico at 500 Years, which is part of the AHA Colloquium series of virtual, virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and look, are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the association or if you're already a member making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of the webinar today. A few logistical things to cover before we start. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's code of professional conduct. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but need to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase the combined questions. Finally, if you'd be like, like to be part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. A quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on our YouTube channel after the session. I now would like to turn things over to John McNeil from Georgetown University, who is the chair of today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm going to introduce our panel of seven speakers uh, in just a moment, but uh, be reminded that um, we'll be using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And because we have um, well over 100 participants, um, I will apologize in advance if we don't get to all of your questions afterwards, but feel free to uh, register them at any point during the presentation. So uh, our Magnificent Seven panelists speaking on the theme of the uh, conquest of Mexico, reevaluating it after 500 years. In this order, um, Kelly McDonough from the University of Texas at Austin, Stephanie Wood from the University of Oregon, John, known to many of you, Fritz Schwaller from SUNY Albany, Jack Bouchard from the Folger Library in Washington, Karen Kupperman from New York University, Brian DeLay from the University of California, and Elijah Gould from the University of New Hampshire. Each of them will speak for something like six to 10 minutes, and I will intrude upon them at nine minutes if they're still going. Kelly, you are first up. Take it away. Great, thank you. Bonjour. Um, before I get started, I really want to thank Fritz Schwaller for bringing us all together, to John McNeil for wrangling the cats today, um, my fellow panelists with whom I'm super honored to be Zooming next to, and for all of you that are taking time in your already Zoom fatigued lives to listen and dialogue with their ideas. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll get started. Uh, in their 2018 essay, Materials and Methods in Native American and Indigenous Studies, Completing the Turn, Alyssa Mount Pleasant, Carolyn Wigginton, and Kelly Wisecup argued that early modern slash colonial historians and literary scholars were well overdue for scholarship that centers Indigenous peoples as active agents, recognizes their local and community specificities, interrogates the conditions of their visibility or invisibility in the archives, takes into consideration their multiple forms of expression, and reconsiders notions of appropriate evidence and methodologies to do so. Among other points, and of the most interest to me in the context of reevaluating the impact of the so-called conquest of Mexico at 500 years, is the suggestion for a reorientation of geographic and temporal borders if we're to more accurately and sensitively include indigenous perspectives in our scholarship. So we know that indigenous peoples can hold geographical notions that do not coincide with those of dominant culture institutions, such as the contemporary nation state. For example, Chile and Argentina may have drawn their own political borders, yet Mapuche peoples envision and experience these same geographical spaces differently by following the contours of their own territorial mappings of the Walmapu. Like geographies, 
It is commonplace to take as a given dominant culture temporalities. In other words, to assume a common experience and understanding of time and periodization. Yet as highlighted by Mark Rifkin in his 2017 book, Beyond Settler Time, Temporal Sovereignty in Indigenous Self-Determination, quote, there is no such thing as an absolute time that applies everywhere at once. Instead, he states, the experience and calculation of time are contingent. In what ways, Rifkin asks, do we fall into the trap of incorporating or translating native life into settler frames of reference? So at this moment of pause and reflect on the implications of the European invasion of what is currently called Mexico, I wanna focus in on what Mount Pleasant et al. and Rifkin's uh, challenge was in terms of broadening and rethinking the temporal scope of our inquiry. What follows are some of the different ways we might think about indigenous temporalities in this context. First is the idea that the 1519 to 1521 war was for some a non-event or at least simply one of many events. Spanish invasion is assumed to be a major turning point in Mexican history, a moment against which indigenous befores and afters are so often marked. But as James Lockhart has reminded us, while war raged in the Central Valley of Anahuac, Many indigenous peoples in other areas were minimally affected. The Spanish invasion was but a blip on their radar, if that. That is, other moments in time are the touchstones with which native befores and afters are marked. Furthermore, as Susan Schroeder has noted, although Spanish accounts portray the conquest as Armageddon, inter-indigenous warring had been going on for centuries. For many, this was but another onslaught in a series of onslaughts. Privileging a native frame of reference suggests that while it's important to recognize and evaluate the gravity of the Spanish invasion for certain peoples, we should not overlook the many other violent occurrences and subsequent coexistences that have shaped native life over the centuries. Another way to think in terms of indigenous temporalities is to emphasize the fact that native life in Mexico did not begin, nor did it end in 1519. Even after decades of excellent revisionist scholarship, we still see the peculiar trend in literary and historical anthologies, as well as in the general public imaginary, the idea that indigenous life both began and ended at Spanish invasion. Paradoxically, indigenous people are discovered and rendered animate with the Western days while they are simultaneously erased presented as never existing before 1519, but at the same time only existing before 1519, a circuitous path that negates the possibility of indigenous life outside of these years of violent contact with Europeans. An intentional recalibration of our starting point to before 1519 highlights indigenous change and continuity regardless of European presence and draws attention to the complexities of inter-indigenous relationships. Although we are working with the constraints of limited pre-1519 archival materials, since Spanish friars burned most of what they came across, scholars such as Maria Castañeda de la Paz have made clear that while not without challenges, the relative paucity of source materials need not foreclose rigorous investigation and analysis of pre-1519 indigenous life. A deeper and more sustained engagement with archeological findings on the part of historians can also help mitigate archival source limitations. After 1521, native peoples tend to disappear in these same literary historical anthologies or appear only very sporadically, mirroring the general public's buy-in of the myth of the vanishing Indian. In Mexico, this is most commonly seen in the discourse of progressive cultural degeneration and eventual dilution of indigeneity that gave way to a de-indigenized mestizo identity. When framed as the defining moment in indigenous life, 1519 to 1521 becomes a line which has been crossed away from an idealized yet unreachable past frozen in settler time to which there is no return. Besides reifying the idea of contact with erasure, a hyper focus on these brief years in the early 16th century can come at the expense of much needed attention to other contexts of ongoing coloniality during the following centuries up to the present day. How did early manifestations of colonialism replicate and in what forms, not just as a residue or legacy of 1519 to 1521, 
but as Chickasaw scholar Shannon Speed has argued, as an ongoing process. Besides more obvious iterations of social, political, economical, economic, and epistemological colonialities, thinking along the lines of Sadia Hartman's scenes of subjection, what are some of the often undetected experiences of terror that have carried on beyond wartime? Does this hyper-focus on the past shield us from uncomfortable conversations and collaborations with indigenous peoples in the present day? Yes, we need to evaluate the impact of 1519 to 1521. But we also need to do so keeping in mind the idea of indigenous temporalities, reminding us that indigenous life in Mexico did not definitively commence or cease at Spanish contact. In the end, I believe that expanding our inquiry to include multiple temporalities provides an alternative manner to looking forward, contemplating if and how our scholarship is aimed at positively affecting indigenous futures. Thank you. Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, you came in under the time limit, which um, as timekeeper, I at least appreciate. Others might've wished you to go on longer. Um, Stephanie, you are next. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to us today. Um, thank you to the organizers. And um, I'm just going to dive in because I think I might be 10 minutes and I don't want to run out of time. So um, as all of us are, I'm rethinking the significance of 1521 and its consequences. Um, my main interest is in the historiography of the Nawas themselves. And I am researching manuscripts that were both pictorial and written in alphabetic Nahuatl. For those unfamiliar with them, there are thousands of manuscripts, especially the, of the alphabetic type, a vast archive that was largely neglected until our lifetimes. And now I'm gonna share my screen. I hope that's okay. If I can figure this out, it takes me one second here. And okay, okay, hope everyone can see that. Um, so this is a manuscript, an example, um, a late colonial manuscript written in Nahuatl. And um, I just want to say that, um, as you can see here, this is a period of a clear uh, comfort with alphabetic writing, but there are still some minor glyphs written in between the lines. So it's sort of a transition time or else the alphabetic author writer was um, trying to work in some you know, of the older heritage. Um, but both visual and alphabetic languages provide a window onto ways of thinking of Nawaz about their own histories. And my goal is to strive for greater balance and authenticity because representation matters in retelling Mexican colonial history from indigenous points of view. The term conquest or conquista actually came into Nahuatl as a loan word from Spanish, suggesting that there were no perfect synonyms in Nahuatl. The Nahuas had the term pewa to start at the enemy and poloa to destroy. They had yalk enemy and yaoyot war but nothing uh, quite like conquest. The term conquistador also entered into Nahuatl as a loan word. Um, but I don't mean to imply that the Aztecs were, uh, were not imperialists. They were in fact, uh, they defeated and colonized hundreds of indigenous communities across a huge region, region taking in much of Mexico and parts of Central America. This um, mid 16th century Codex Mendoza, you have a sample page in front of you, um, is what Europeans might consider a conquest history, a Nawa conquest history, um, with page after page of Indian towns defeated by Aztec warriors. There are something like 212 burning palaces in all in this manuscript. But these towns survived because tribute in labor and kind were the desired one of the desired objects uh, of the pursuit of creating this empire. In the Relaciones Geográficas 16th century Spanish language manuscripts, um, when asked about conquest history, some towns actually recalled this, uh, their memories of this kind of local expansionism by Ashayakat and, and other Aztec conquerors. 
uh, going back to the 1470s, for example. Um, and so the Aztec empire was more in the minds of some towns than the Spanish empire, even though the inquiries of the 16th century from the crown were, uh, were interested in getting at the Spanish invasion. Um, the novel view of the Spanish conquest as a watershed in history grew over time um, through growing contact and exposure to education at the hands of the friars. But even still, uh, their view of that was very different from Spanish viewpoints. In the early alphabetic and visual Nahua accounts of the Spanish invasion and seizure of power, it can be confusing who is playing the role of the supportive ally. <clears throat> Sometimes such as we see here in the, uh, an example from the Lienzo de Tlaxcala, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have a war fought where the Spanish are, the are in the supportive role and the Tlaxcalteca are in the lead. And of course they way outnumbered the Spaniards as well. Um, the Spanish invaders helped enemies of the Aztecs bring down the empire and replace it with a new one. And the Nahuas from all across uh, the region and different origins, ethnic origins, helped create this new empire along with others, some other peoples. Um, and it was almost as though the Nahuas were reshaping their own empire with the help of these Spanish allies. And they knew as a result that they would have a significant role in the new empire. And they wanted future generations to know it too. Um, <clears throat> the Tlatoque, uh, local indigenous rulers, uh, facilitated many changes in exchange for Spanish recognition of their authority and their territories at the city state level. They also got a portion of the tributes that they collected. By late colonial, Spanish colonial times, these leaders evolved into caciques, uh, which I think is a term that captures their greater self-interest. Um, and that is not to say that the Nahua society was not already quite hierarchical. Uh, on the screen you have here a cacique from the Puebla area hugging Cortes uh, and being very grateful that, uh, for all that Cortes did to help and Cortes was on his way back to Spain and this cacique felt like he was being left in charge. As time passed, Nahua alphabetic and pictorial records began to portray a very distilled view of the events of the early 16th century, such as you see here in front of you with the map the Mapa of Tlalpan. Um, we, in the um, texts that accompany these pictorials, we hear about the refounding of indigenous towns. They aren't called refounding, they're just called founding, but we know that they existed prior to the invasion and colonization. So they're refounding their towns, they're formating indigenous town councils along the Cabildo Spanish model uh, with certain changes that implied, but it also implied continued indigenous leadership at the local level. There were changes in tribute requirements. We hear about the arrival of the faith, uh, referring to uh, Christianity without often saying so specifically. Baptisms are celebrated. We see churches coming to stand in place of the Altepet city-state symbols of prior times. Our iconic figures such as the Marques, who was, that was often the, what was, um, well, it was the title of Cortez, and that's what he was often called by indigenous people. We also see Malinche, as, as in this manuscript here, uh, who was the interpreter. She has a, a crown like Mary in this uh, detail, which I wish I could show you if I had more time. Moctezuma appears very often. Those uh, caciques who felt they or claimed that they descended from Moctezuma had a lot to do with sort of sprinkling him through lots of different manuscripts as a major figure of the early 16th century. The horrific 16th century epidemics, um, which continued actually periodically into the 18th century, um, are often mentioned more in relationship to the congregating of towns, which was seen as strengthening some indigenous communities in these histories. Um, to us, it's a little bit surprising that the epidemics don't get more attention, but a lot of people died and those who survived then had time to grapple with uh, that history, but largely let it go. Um, here's another pictorial. This is the uh, lienzo from Tepeaca, Puebla in front of us now. And uh, here, uh, well, this is a manuscript from 1801, but I believe it's a copy of something made in 1671. Uh, this is a Spanish translation of what was probably a Nahuatl language manuscript. Um, we see the use of the loanword conquista a little bit awkward in, and I think the translation was therefore made by Nahuatl. 
Um, but anyway, it's interesting to see the Nahua caciques dressed as Spaniards, carrying swords and claiming glory for their roles in a conquest that is very vague. Uh, no details, no, <laughs> no real clear sense of what they mean by conquest here, This loan, using the loan word, I'm sure. But judging from the rest of the manuscript, they were indigenous leaders who helped refound their towns in the colonial context, um, but they still don't call themselves conquistadores per se. I think they were beginning, you know, thinking of them in that themselves in that role. But most later accounts um, written in Nahuatl describe the Nahuatl leaders as Tlalma Seuke, uh, which really literally means land achievers, land winners, um, and is often translated into English as town founder. So that's not, that's a little bit different from conqueror, the concept of the conqueror. Um, all the emphasis for the Nawas is on the growing strength of the indigenous Pueblo. Um, the indigenous leaders' cooperation with Spanish colonizers meant a smoother colonization uh, and a redirection of conquest, if you want to think of it that way, uh, impulses away from mass destruction. So Nawas rarely thought of, of the Spanish conquest as more than some battles and a shift in power succeeded by a growing strength of the Altepet. They did recognize colonial abuses and I don't wanna minimize that and what that says about the colonial experience for them. And they rose up again and again, especially in the 18th century in tumultos, uh, uprisings and riots. They regularly complained about the Spanish colonizers who were living in their midst, midst even if they would praise the king. Um, so they so, did not complain. Yes. Nine minutes. Okay, I have, I'll be done. <laughs> they did not conclude anything about annihilation the extremely negative views of Spanish colonialism perhaps would have erased their own agency and their survival mechanisms. So we don't hear of that point of view. And I just wanna close with a half minute story uh, from Oregon. I am here on Kalapuya land, uh, as you'll see on the map of Oregon in front of you. But this story from um, the late guardian of our university longhouse uh, was actually a member of the Klamath Nation, which I've also highlighted on the map. In 1992, uh, during the Colombian quincentenary, which was another 500th anniversary that was observed by scholars, but not just by scholars, there was a sort of a, what you might call a pan-Indian uh, gathering by the Klamath who invited some Mexica to Oregon. Uh, they had a meeting, they sat down together and the Mexica said to the Klamath, wow, we thought the cowboys killed you all off. And the Klamath said back to the Mexica, well, we thought the Spanish conquistadores killed you all off. And then both groups at once said, we are still here. And I just think that's really telling. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, Fritz, you are next. Well, thank you all very, very much. I am, I am thrilled to be here. Uh, I am so pleased that this is actually happening. Uh, we, it, it's, it's been in, in the planning for, for quite a while. Uh, as opposed to my colleagues, uh, Kelly and Stephanie, who've looked at the indigenous reaction, I'm going to be looking uh, at the reaction of the Spanish. Uh, and looking at the colony that resulted from the Spanish invasion of Mexico, there's little doubt uh, in the, of, of the truth of the adage that to the victor go the spoils and that history is written by winners. Certainly the Spanish invaders quickly sought to create a political, social and economic system over which they would rule using the defeated native nations as a convenient source of labor and taxes. Now, using many of the same policies in the New World as the Castilian crown had used during the Reconquest, uh, it, the, the, the Spanish began to create their colonial system. Uh, there was a tension, however, that emerged between the desires of the conquerors and the desires of the crown over who's going to control this whole system. Power emanated from the person of the monarch and the brief experience of a few decades of setting up the colonial administration had demonstrated to the crown that it was better served to appoint individuals that had no ties to the local region that they were serving rather than use the conquistadors and the early settlers uh, who were on the ground. 
Thus, the crown initially populated the administrative ranks of the colonial government with individuals sent over from Spain specifically for that purpose. Now, several generations of Latin American historians believe that one of the causes for the eventual rebel rebellions of independence in the 19th century was specifically the history of local interests having been excluded from their own governance. Uh, this is an example of uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. I've been teaching historiography, sorry. Uh, research in the mid to late 20th century, however, gave the lie to that hypothesis by demonstrating that by the 17th century, local interests, specifically the locally born Spanish colonists known as Creoles, had in fact dominated the royal bureaucracy from town councils all the way up to high court magistrates. While much of this was attributed to the sale of public office, because all of these positions were eventually sold uh, by the 17th century, less research has focused on the nature of governance in the late 16th century before the sale of public office became widespread. Clearly, in the first decades after the Spanish invasion, the governmental structure was dominated by men who came over from Spain specifically to govern the colony. The conquerors were rewarded grants of tribute from local native populations. Uh, but with the phased abolition of those grants starting in 1542, there was a massive opposition to the crown among the ranks of the conquerors and their kin because they were going to be losing an important source of income. Now to mollify this articulate and powerful group, the monarch decreed through a series of orders that heirs of the conquerors would be given first consideration within the government in appointments by local viceroys and governors. Now in my early research on the Catholic church clergy, it became clear that by 1575, Creoles in general, and the sons of conquerors in particular came to dominate the ranks of the clergy and even rose to become bishops uh, by the end of the 16th century. Now, merely because the king offered preference to the sons of conquerors in royal appointments doesn't mean that the local viceroy or governor actually did that. Indeed, one of the impressions from the literature has been that the Creoles in general and descendants of the conquerors in particular were excluded from governmental positions. Leslie, Leslie Bird Simpson, writing in the late 1960s, claimed that the children of the conquerors had been replaced by, and I quote, vigorous, hard-handed men from Spain as lords of the political and economic system. This was no doubt influenced by writers in the waning years of the 16th century who complained to the crown that viceroys were appointing their servants and hangers on to local magistracies rather than recognizing the heirs of the conquerors. Unfortunately, when we begin to look at exactly who was being appointed and serving as local magistrate, the picture is not clear. The figures demonstrate that the glass was not quite half empty for heirs, uh, but you also have to question whether or not it was half full. Apropos of the complaint, in the late 16th century, two viceroys filed reports regarding the number of descendants of conquerors whom they appointed as local magistrates. These were Don Luis de Velasco, the Younger, and the Count of Monterey. Now, Velasco reported to the Crown in 1590 about the local magistrates that he'd appointed in the year since he was appointed. Uh, while Monterey filed his report in 1598 after two years of having served in the highest office. The Velasco report contained 63 names, while Monterey described 142. Now, the Velasco list only included descendants of conquerors and early settlers, while the Monterey list included everybody that he had appointed. Now, clearly, either viceroy could file a misleading report describing appointments to fictitious individuals, since in Madrid, bureaucrats may not be familiar with the local Mexican society. Fortunately for historians, we have independent records in the form of pay rosters from the royal treasury to local magistrates. Thus, we can actually know who was serving. And using these records to corroborate and amplify the viceregal reports, we can identify 194 officers from the time of Velasco and 172 from Monterey. 
Now, we also have sources, both by contemporary historians and also by colonial authors who attempted to determine who the heirs and descendants of the conquerors were. Now, using both those ancient documents and modern studies, we find some remarkable results. Velasco probably underestimated the number of conquerors' heirs that he appointed. His account reflected that about one in three appointees came from that group. Using treasury records and the genealogical sources, these, these folks probably represented well over half of all of his appointees, around 58% to, to be more exact. In the case of the Monterey reports, he indicated that about three quarters of his appointments were to members of the conqueror and settler group. Using treasury records and those genealogical reports, the number increases to a whopping 85%. Clearly in the last decade of the 16th century, descendants of the conquerors and early settlers increased dramatically among the ranks of local magistrates. Other sources report that this tendency increased in the 17th century, especially after these office, offices began to be sold at public auction. At that point, nearly all magistrates were Creoles, and most of them had deep ties to the colony. So one report to this hypothesis is that it represents lies, damn lies, and statistics. While it is possible to quibble over each and every name and argue whether the record indicates that Juan Diaz was the son of a conqueror or maybe just some other Juan Diaz, the important message is that well over half of the local magistrates by the end of the 16th century came from the conqueror and early settler group. While the crown may have wrestled with the inclusion of these men in the royal bureaucracy in the early decades of the colony, the reality is that by the end of the century, they were not, they were, if not in charge, certainly a force to be reckoned with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fritz. Um, we're doing nicely on the time. Jack Bouchard is next. Jack? All right. Um Thank you so much for that. I mean, thank you for so many people and for everyone um, for, for showing up to this, um, for, for these ongoing discussions. Um, thank you, of course, to AHA for hosting us, uh, to John for chairing for us, and um, most of all for Fritz for organizing this and pulling me into this because I'm very excited to be part of these discussions um, and really to have been prompted by all of you to think about revisiting the Spanish invasion and conquest of Mexico, because it's not something I often get to think about. So I am a scholar who normally studies um, the 16th century Northwest Atlantic, the origins of what we think of as the Newfoundland fisheries. And like most who study the early far North, I was taught <laughs> much not to think about the South, that to some extent, you know, the far North Atlantic and the mid-Atlantic, Newfoundland and Mexico, are entirely separate worlds and never the twain shall meet. But clearly the fall of Tenochtitlan is a world historical event of tremendous importance and one whose aftershocks were felt immediately as well as long-term as we're seeing um, in this discussion. And I think we need to consider how the consequences of the fall of Tenochtitlan may have reverberated within an early Atlantic world, one which includes the subarctic and places like Newfoundland and its fisheries. So I wanna, um, in the next few minutes, offer a few ideas. Uh, they are not arguments, but sort of useful, potentially fruitful lines of inquiry as to how we can think about this problem. And I take as a starting point that there, this sort of inherent north-south divide in the historiography of the 16th century Americas and the 16th century Atlantic would not have been clear or well understood um, at the time. And this is especially true of the 1520s, a tremendously tumultuous decade where a lot of things are changing very quickly in the Western Atlantic. And certainly it is the case that in the 1520s, Newfoundland and its waters were understood by Europeans as part of an emerging Iberian Western Atlantic world one which would ultimately, by the end of the decade, include New Spain as well. Because after all, in the 1520s, you didn't go to Newfoundland. You went to Terra Nova, 
Um, it's, it's a Portuguese term appropriated by the Spanish and used by mariners across Europe to describe what we think of as the fisheries of the Northwest Atlantic. And on maps, you wouldn't see Newfoundland. Um, you would see uh, the land of Bacala, an Iberian word for salt cod. You would see the land of Labrador or Corto Real, named for Portuguese mariners who had been some of the first explorers in the region. If you did go there, you'd be rubbing elbows with Galicians and Astorians and Basques and Portuguese, um, that Iberians are collectively one of the most numerous contingents in the Northwest Atlantic. So Terra Nova in the 1520s is very much an Iberian space connected to the wider Iberian Atlantic in thought and practice, um, which was on the cusp of being colonized, as they thought, by Iberian actors. I th think that that is a necessary framework for approaching the rise of New Spain after 1521, because it means that the fall of Tenochtitlan takes place within an Iberian Atlantic world, which includes Newfoundland. They are part of a shared system. And there is reason to believe, I think, that the events of 1521 have a swift, if ultimately indirect impact on the history of Newfoundland's fisheries at this time. Um, because like, even if we can't really see direct links, um, you know, a one-to-one -one sort of cause and effect between the fall of Tenochtitlan and if, um, changes at Newfoundland, we might expect that there are consequences that ripple outward. And we expect that the events in Mexico to influence and ultimately to shape European behavior in the Northwest Atlantic. And I'm particularly interested in whether there are sort of contemporaneous consequences in the early to mid 16th century. Because as I see it, the Spanish Mexica Wars produce many fundamental changes that become apparent as the 1520s go on, right? It is, it is a, a change and set of changes which only become more apparent to Europeans um, as the decade progresses rather than immediately. Um, but things like creating new opportunities for Spanish and non-Spanish imperial actors in New Spain and in the Caribbean as a kind of supporting system. It offers a new kind of model of conquest, empire, settlement, appropriation in the Americas. It creates a new point of inter-imperial rival rivalry within the European Atlantic. Everyone wants to create the new Spain and, and to rival them. Um, we see a new demand for resources and commitments in both Mexico um, and in a sort of insular Caribbean to support them. And finally, it generates new ideas and importantly, expectations about indigenous communities in the Americas and how Europeans can control them. If we consider then the view from Newfoundland while this is going on, for mariners at Terra Nova, and for European imperial actors thinking about this space, these are changes of tremendous consequence. These are changes which will define the economic and political context of the Western Atlantic and the coastal Americas for the rest of the 16th century. The Spanish Mexica Wars provide new ways to think about the Americas and colonization, and New Spain ultimately becomes a rival, a draw of resources and attention vis-a-vis -vis Newfoundland, um, away from other parts of the Iberian Atlantic. So how does this play out in practice? I would suggest that though it's often overlooked, around 1520, there is widespread enthusiasm and interest in Europe to explore and colonize North America, on different parts of the East Coast of North America, but very much including Newfoundland. So around the year 1520, there's this kind of wave of exploration. Um, Verrazzano on the East Coast for France, um, Gomes and Ayon for Spain on the different parts of the East Coast around the same time. Uh, Joao Fagundes for Portugal um, uh, explores uh, the Newfoundland area and both John Rastel and John Rutt for England do the same in the Newfoundland area. And critically, they're followed up by um, attempts to plant settlements. Ponce de Leon's failed attempts in 1521 in Florida, in the same year, 1521, Henry VIII tries to raise money for a colony in Newfoundland. Neither of those work, but we do have temporarily successful attempts by Aon in 1526 in the Carolinas. A couple years before that, um, Joao Facundes for Portugal plants a colony in Cape Breton. So around 1526, there are actually, for a bit, Iberian colonies in both the Carolinas and at Cape Breton. But of course, the moment passes. The colonies don't survive, they disappear, and interest dissipates. And in a bigger sense, Newfoundland drops off the mental map of empire. 
and there won't be outright colonization. And for the rest of the century, there's pretty limited integration with the rest of the colonial Atlantic world. So we should ask why. I think it's the case that as the magnitude of, from their perspective, um, Spanish opportunity and commitment become clear as the 1520s go on, uh, and as other powers respond to that, it deflects attention and investment away from North America, away from Newfoundland. And it deflects an historical trajectory which had been trending towards outright colonization of the East Coast of North America. At the same time, it encourages this sort of brief um, blip in more intensive activity. Because in the 1530s and 40s, um, many European uh, state-backed ventures seek out a kind of Mexican experience in the North, try and find indigenous communities um, in what is today Eastern Canada, which fit this kind of Mexica model. Um, if you think of Cartier's voyages on the River of Canada in the 1530s, his portrayal in Ramusio's um, history of navigation of Ochalaga as a kind of northern Tenochtitlan, um, visually and in his description. Um, in 1542, Spanish authorities interrogate Basque fishermen coming back from Newfoundland. Uh, and it's clear from their line of inquiry, they're trying to prompt them to divulge where the sort of Mexica of the North might be living so they could be conquered and integrated. But these expectations about indigenous societies have no place in the Northwest Atlantic. Um, Algonquian speaking communities, uh, Iroquois and Inuit speaking communities um, are organized socially, politically, economically, totally differently. And I believe I'm at nine minutes. Um, so what becomes clear rather quickly is that European empires will withdraw from this imperial landscape, will pull back from empire in the Northwest Atlantic and leave fish workers. These are changes which have huge consequences. And let me end by suggesting that on the one hand, it means for indigenous communities in the Northwest Atlantic, that it will shape their limited interactions um, with Europeans across the 16th century. But for Newfoundland region as a whole, it ensures no permanent European settlement, no permanent European presence for nearly a century until the first permanent settlements are planted in 1610 and the 17th century ushers in something radically new. I think that those are give you a sense of how these events in Mexico can reverberate outward very quickly in sort of subtle indirect ways in this early Atlantic world um, and shape the colonial economic political trajectory of a place like Newfoundland and its fisheries down to the present day. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Karen Cooperman is next. Karen. Karen, you're still muted. So I'm going to start with a slightly different take from Jack's on the Newfoundland area fishing. Uh, so the English, of course, were extremely slow in planting permanent colonies, but you know, I'm following David Quinn in arguing that they were uh, involved in fishing, possibly even before 1492 uh, uh, off Newfoundland. And I think at least from the English point of view, the beauty of the fishing trade is that it didn't require colonies. You could get the product in, you know, through the summer, go home in the fall, and you didn't have the expense of colonies. Of course, England was a very poor country. Uh, but my, uh, then I'm further arguing that this involvement in the fishing trade did then involve English uh, fishermen, English merchants in a kind of at least Atlantic wide trade. And we know there were uh, resident communities of English merchants in many Spanish cities because they were bringing the fish to Spain and then uh, they were getting the products of warm climates, wine, raisins, other things that uh, England otherwise didn't have access to. Uh, so, as Barbara Fuchs documents in her forthcoming article, The Devil in a Rich Country, English Reception of the Conquest of Mexico, Spain's activities in Mexico did not appear in English publications for several decades after 
the conquest. Uh, and she argues that it's in the 1550s with the marriage of Mary Tudor and King Philip of Spain that suddenly all these accounts uh, start to appear of Spanish exploits. Richard Eden was one of the, the translators who published heavily in this field. Uh, although his account of the Peter, his, his translation of Peter Martyr's account of the conquest did not actually appear in print in England until 15, in the 1570s. So uh, Eden, Eden's commentary in the mid 16th century presented Spanish ventures as heroic and urged English emulation. Uh, he justified the expropriation of native people by the fact that they were saved from idolatry and the practice of human sacrifice. Uh, there apparently was no human sacrifice in Europe. So then this kind of admiration of Spanish exploits changes with the beginning of the privateering wars in the 1580s. And they seize on uh, Las Casas's indictment of the Spanish record. And this becomes then the standard account. It's first published in 1583. Under the tra translation is published under the title of the Spanish colony. In 1584, Richard Hacklett's Discourse of Western Planting set the tone with descriptions of the incredible and more than barbarous, savage, endless cruelties of the Spanish. Descriptions drawn, as he wrote, from Bartholomew de las Casas, a bishop in Nova España. Uh, and then this, the tone was that the English were and would be completely different in colonization. So Robert Johnson, uh, wrote, for example, that the Virginia, that colonization in Virginia would eschew the raging cruelties that killed so many millions of naked Indians in the West Indies. Instead, Virginia would be settled by fair and loving means suiting to our English natures. Uh, and when English colonists became unruly or ungovernable as in the early years in Jamestown, they were described as being Italianated and Spanielized. And that came partly from living in a hot climate. Uh, so this black legend becomes established, but despite that, I'm arguing that the English uh, sent sentiment was well, first of all, that the English government and English leaders kept very, very close ties to Spain. That, you know, for example, one uh, uh, instance is that some of the most important documents concerning Jamestown are actually in the Spanish archives in Seville and in unique copies. Uh, so there were agents in London who, who, to whom these things were given and then they would be taken to Spain. Uh, and it has been uh, said that all of the, the, you know, there's that famous painting of the Treaty of London in 1604 that ended the Anglo-Spanish War. And all the English people sitting around that table were on the Spanish payroll. So even though they're talking the black legend, there's still very, very close connections. And of course, uh, the first permanent colony within what became the United States is St. Augustine. Uh, and, and David Hurst Thomas says that St. Augustine was finally successful. As Jack said, there were numerous to attempts before that. Uh, it was successful because the Spanish were willing to accommodate to the, the uh, native methods and um, 
So he, Thomas says that St. Augustine was another powerful Mississippian chiefdom. And the Franciscans in the mission scattered throughout Florida and Georgia reinforced longstanding traditions of chiefly power over land and labor. So uh, this is 1565, St. Augustine. It would be a very long time before the English were able to establish a permanent colony in North America. England was still a relatively poor country. As John Dunn said, it was the suburbs of the old world. So I'm arguing that English and then American regard for, for Spain was continued to be a mixture of admiration and envy. Many sermons were printed about Virginia in 1609 because the Virginia company got a new charter and was planning a very ambitious venture. Uh, and every single one of these sermons excoriates Henry VII for turning Columbus away and depriving the English of what they could have had. Uh, and I think always lurking but never articulated was the key question. Why would God allow the Spanish Catholics to have all the wealth when you know the, the English practice true religion? <laughs> and I mean, it's not articulated because they didn't want to know the answer, I think. So in the 19th century, new versions emerged. I have recently learned of a story recorded in the 1810s by Jean-Antoine Jean Leclerc under his pen name, which was Louis Milfort. Uh, and he was told that Muscogean people were a powerful separate republic in the Northwest of Mexico. And they came to the ruler Montezuma's aid they were frightfully decimated by the Spaniards and disdaining abject slavery, preferred to leave their native country. And so they made their way across the Southern US to settle near the Atlantic coast. Nine, and in, nine minutes. Pardon me? Nine minutes. Oh, okay. So uh, let me cut here. Uh, I, I wanted to say two things. One is that I think that in the later 19th century, at the same time that we were cementing racial hierarchies and all that, we also sort of reinvented the story of the Spanish presence. So in Uncle Tom's Cabin, for example, uh, when Ophelia Sinclair sees the Sinclair mansion in New Orleans, she's, she says it's heathenish. It carried the mind back as in a dream to the reign of Oriental romance in Spain. And so as Edward Ayers puts it, the South is portrayed as the Latin America of North America. So, uh, but I think the, the, the admiration slash envy continues. There's a lot of Spanish stuff in the images in the US Capitol that were put there in the middle of the 19th century. And I think even today, we see it with towns with names like uh, Potosi in Missouri and uh, Wisconsin and Nevada. I'm not sure how they pronounce it in Wisconsin and Nevada, but it's definitely Potosi in Missouri. Uh, and every American I have ever met absolutely believes the black legend even though they've never actually heard of it in those it, under that label. Thank you, Karen. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, next up, Brian DeLay. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you uh, for everyone that took the time to tune in today. Uh, thank you, Fritz, for organizing this. It's uh, an honor to be part of this conversation with my excellent colleagues. Uh, and in my comments today, I'm going to offer some thoughts about how North Americanists might take inspiration from new work on the conquest of Mexico, specifically 
as an admiring tourist in this scholarship, it inspires me to think more deliberately about how narratives of European conquest can obscure indigenous politics and international systems. When I was at graduate school in the 1990s, the heroic tale of a handful of conquistadors overthrowing a mighty empire had, uh, of course, come under sustained attack for some time. Ethno-historians, particularly James Lockhart and his students had already destabilized core aspects of that Eurocentric narrative. These scholars revealed a variety of new factors and actors and contingencies and contexts relevant to the conquest of Mexico, including the basic fact that other Nahuas did most of the fighting against the Mexica. This emphasis on native allies and auxiliaries or ethnic soldiering as um, Neil Whitehead uh, uh, frames the European practice of recruiting indigenous military adjuncts, this had the narrative effect of placing a prominent asterisk next to the phrase conquest of Mexico. Now it seems that the asterisk is no longer uh, sufficient. Remarkable new books by Camilla Townsend and Matt Restall um, and the many, many scholars that they both draw upon to um, create these remarkable books. They reframe the events and the narration of 1519 and 1521 in a whole lot of fascinating ways. The reframing that most interests me here is a shift in narrative emphasis from indigenous manpower, the native ally or the ethnic soldiering storyline to an emphasis on indigenous politics. By centering the dynastic and the strategic concerns, as well as the political maneuvering of Tlaxcalan and Texcocan leaders, among others, Restall's book in particular situates the Spanish intrusion within a large and complicated system of polities in the Valley of Mexico. Restall doesn't use this term, but to my eyes, the interactions of polities in central Mexico that he examines so wonderfully was an international system. Sophisticated, culturally informed scholarship grounded in indigenous language sources that center that international system gets us much closer to understanding outcomes than the self-indulgent narratives of conquest that Europeans have told themselves uh, and the rest of the world for the last several centuries. All of this begs the question of the degree to which the familiar interpretive frame could or should be reversed. Um, the degree to which we should see the Spanish as adjuncts to Nawa political and military projects rather than the other way around. And here I think of Stephanie's wonderful slide uh, showing the Tlash Collins in the lead. Um, so should we see it that way? Clearly, the answer to that question depends in part on the time horizon in question. That kind of reversal seems plausible and even clarifying for the pivotal years 1519 to 1521, but over the longer view, such a reframing could obscure the reality of Spanish domination. The fact that Tlaxcalan and Texcocan political and military projects played an indispensable role in the creation of New Spain makes it easy to understand the appeal, maybe even the necessity at some level, of a Whiggish and Eurocentric narrative of the conquest of Mexico. At the same time, Restall argues persuasively that the phrase should be jettisoned or at least restrained behind scare quotes as he does throughout the book because the conquest of Mexico, in quotes, is a frame that has had such power to misdirect and confuse as to what actually happened 500 years ago. I think that this grappling with the conquest of Mexico raises useful questions about narratives of conquest in the rest of North America. Almost always, from the early colonial period through the late 19th century, European or Euro-American conquests were aided by native allies. In the colonial period, especially indigenous allies are often far more numerous than European actors themselves at critical moments of conquest. There's a lot of examples, albeit uh, all of them on a much smaller scale than uh, the drama that unfolded in the Valley of Mexico. In 1637, in the defining event of the Pequot War, for example, 90 English colonists burned hundreds of men, women, and children to death in a fortified village on the Mystic River. Those 90 colonists were able to do that because they were in the company of 570 Mohegan and Narragansett warriors. 
1713, during the Tuscarora War in North Carolina, 33 armed colonists killed or captured nearly a thousand Tuscaroras. Those 33 colonists could do that because they were in the company of 900 Yamases and Cherokees. A similar point can be made about broader, more defining events in colonial history. Take, for example, Metacom's War in New England and the Pueblo Revolt and the eventual Spanish Reconquest of New Mexico. Both are framed primarily in the literature as landmark anti-colonial rebellions, which they obviously were, but they were also complex international events whose progress and eventual suppression depended upon the geopolitics of multiple sovereign polities interacting within a shared regional international system. To what degree should we frame these and so many other similar events and conflicts in North American history as expressions of indigenous international relations first and colonialism and European conquest second? Or if that's going too far, can we simultaneously employ both frames? That is, can we attend to the contingency and the complexity of indig indigenous international relations on the one hand and acknowledge the context and the exceptional unfolding threat of European conquest and settler colonialism on the other. It's not easy to balance these things, um, though here we should of course distinguish between broader synthetic and popular narratives uh, on the one hand and the specialized scholarship on the other. Most popular history makes little room for indigenous international systems even when written about mostly sympathetically, which is increasingly the norm in uh, general histories, native peoples remain tragic defiant characters reacting to European intrusion and conquest. To do anything else, to prioritize political or strategic concerns that don't directly involve Europeans is to wander out of the frame. The specialized scholarship is obviously different. Over the past couple of decades, there's been fabulous work centering indigenous agency and indigenous power. Some of this scholarship has forcefully insisted that even centuries after contact for many native polities in North America, relations with other indigenous nations mattered far, far more than did relations with Europeans or European American powers. That's a crucial truth. One that even the specialized literature overall, I think still understates. The most important and obvious reason why it's understated has to do, I think, with sources. The nature of the colonial archive makes it almost inevitable that Europe and its project gets undue attention. And here the work of our colleagues on the conquest history, the new conquest history is both inspiring, but also uh, I think a little bit dispiriting. Inspiring because it is so brilliantly used documents written in indigenous languages to move beyond Spanish language sources. And dispiriting because there is no comparably vast indigenous written archive in British or French North America. But the colonial uh, archive isn't the only challenge to properly centering native politics. Got it, I'll be done. Uh, and the continent's indigenous international system generally. So there are other barriers to, to centering these two things. The venerable frame of European conquest and more recently the frame of settler colonialism both inevitably set our analyses spinning around a European pole as clarifying and as important as these frames are. Both frames necessarily take our attention away from international systems dominated by indigenous polities. But that's what most of North America was for the last 500 years, an international system dominated by indigenous polities. So it seems to me that the challenge is how to do justice to that complex and often difficult to access indigenous reality without obscuring or minimizing the brutal and transformative reality of conquest and settler colonialism. Uh, doing this is very complicated, but acknowledging the complication is progress. And here again, I think that North Americans have a lot to learn from our colleagues working on central Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Last word, Elijah Gould. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, just thanks to everyone. Uh, okay, let me uh, start with what for at least uh, audiences in the United States is one of the most memorable views of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. The German American history painter Emanuel Leutz's storming of the Teocalli by Cortez and his troops painted in 1848. Uh, the painting is not, of course, Leutz's most memorable painting. That honor goes to Washington crossing the Delaware, painted in 1851. But Leutz's painting of the Teocalli briefly became almost as famous when it headlined a 1991 ex exhibition on the West as America at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Art in Washington, DC. Although the painting wasn't about the Western United States, which was the exhibition's focus, it was the first thing visitors saw when they entered the exhibition space. It was overwhelmingly what they wanted to talk about in the public comments book, and it was what many reviewers chose to focus on in the public published responses. Perverse, historically inaccurate, destructive, wrote the former Librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, on the first page of the comments book. No credit to the Smithsonian. Not everyone shared those views. Although I hesitate to admit that I was an ABD grad student in 1991, I was among the visitors that spring and found the Lloyds of painting fascinating. Lots of people, however, agreed with Borston. In an assessment written several years later, William Treutner, the uh, exhibition's curator, attributed much of the furor to the text on the two panels mounted next to the display. The first suggests that Leutz's contemporaries might have associated the painting with popular illustrations of the Mexican War, which was just ending. There were few objections to that one. The panel that provoked the controversy was the second, which said part of Leutz's purpose was to take issue with 19th century accounts that depicted Native Americans as willing recipients of Christian missionaries. The storm in the Teocalli, according to the panel text, quote, acknowledges a more militant spirit in which the might of Christianity prevails against a dark and bloodthirsty foe, a judgment Leutz's contemporaries would have applied to Plains Indians. Although the brutality of Cortez's men is on full display, many visitors and reviewers thought the reference to the might of Christianity ignored or downplayed the soldiers' violence, and in so doing, cast Leutz's painting as a, quote, endorsement of the Spanish conquest. Well, the truth, as Treutner noted in his retrospective assessment, was and is a good deal more complicated. A number of contemporary reviews, when Leutz's painting was first displayed, commented on what the American Art Union's bulletin called the, quote, terrible ferocity of the action. And some thought that maybe the author, the artist had gone too far. In 1848, Leutze, whose family had emigrated to the United States when he was a boy, was working in Dusseldorf, Germany, when he did the painting. The vivid depiction of combat may have drawn on street fighting that Leutz a witness as a participant in and supporter of the failed revolution of 1848 in Berlin and other German cities. A more direct source, however, uh, uh, is William H. Prescott, whose history of the conquest of Mexico published in 1843 had recently been published and played a key role in popularizing the anti-Catholic black legend with American readers. The man who commissioned the painting was Amos Binney, a wealthy physician, whoops, sorry, <laughs> uh, and scientist who happened to be Prescott's friend and fellow trustee at the Boston Athenaeum. Although Binney's instructions to Leutze do not survive, he died in 1847, a year before the painting was completed, they almost certainly included references to Prescott's text, especially Prescott's dramatic portrayal of the struggle between the Spanish and Mexica at the Teocalli. One of the many liberties that Leutze took was to suggest that the battle was the conquest's final climactic episode, when in fact Cortez and his men withdrew. In terms of the spirit of Prescott's history, however, the painting is remarkably faithful to the original. The conquistadors are clearly on the right side of history in inverted quotes, in the sense that they are about to win, but the regime that they are about to create will be nearly as brutal and superstition ridden as the one they are in the process of overthrowing. And note here, uh, 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 Leutz's painting on a modern edition of Prescott's history. With that, I'd like to make two final points, both of which are evident in Leutz's painting, about views in the early United States of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. First, by the 1840s, the relationship between the United States and Spain's former dominion of Mexico was deeply asymmetric. <clears throat> 
with good reason, Amy Greenberg has labeled the war of conquest that the United States waged against its southern neighbor as the wicked war. Nonetheless, during their first 70 years as an independent nation or empire, Americans repeatedly reversed that asymmetry, casting themselves as David to a Spanish and Mexican Goliath. Significantly, Spain's American empire reached its greatest extent at the end of the War of the American Independence with a continental frontier that stretched from St. Augustine on Florida's Atlantic coast to Nootka Sound in the Pacific Northwest. And here we see Bernardo de Galvez's uh, famous victory at the Siege of Pensacola in, 18, in 1781, adding uh, Florida to uh, Spain's empire. During the United States 30 year struggle for Spanish Florida and Louisiana, which was only settled by the Adams of Nice Transcontinental Treaty of 1821, the map is shown here, Spain loosed, loomed as a public enemy in the North American Republic's imagination, second only to Britain, enticing adventures like Andrew Jackson during the first Seminole War, but threatening and imperiling the Republic as well. And here we see uh, Andrew Jackson uh, uh, um, during that war. For that reason, the conquest of Mexico in 1848 signaled the United States arrival as a great hemispheric power as Spain's displacer, if not its successor. Uh, significantly, in Cara Neville's painting of General Winfield Scott's entrance in 1847 into Mexico City, the cathedral forms a striking backdrop to the soldiers on parade, underscoring the power and grandeur of the empire that the Anglo-Americans had just defeated. Uh, and of course, that I think is a message in Leutz's painting as well. The second message of Leutz's painting, and of course of Prescott's history in the entire black legend genre, however, was that the United States was a more benevolent and humane empire than the Spanish and Mexican empires that Americans believed they were destined to replace. This was easily the most important part of Leutz's message, as well as the part that had the deepest roots, as Karin Kupperman has just mentioned. Uh, and here we see the Massachusetts seal, uh, uh, with its, uh, in 1629, uh, its figure of an indigenous figure asking the English to quote, come over and help us. The request was theological, but it also suggested protection from the New World's other Europeans, especially Catholic Spain. Uh, and that trope of imperial benevolence is also evident in another celebrated Leutze painting, Westward, the course of empire takes its way from 1862. This one hangs in the west stairway of the U.S. Capitol's house wing. Uh, and this, of course, is a very different image of conquest. Although the settlers moving west are armed, they travel with livestock, farm implements, and most important, their families, providing a domestic contrast to the unchecked mascul masculine brutality of the Spanish conquistadors. There is nary a hint of the gratuitous violence that Leutze's contemporaries found so disturbing in the storming of the Teocalli. If Leutze had gone too far with the quote, terrible ferocity of the action in his earlier canvas, the exaggeration may well have been deliberate. The absence of violence in the one that hangs in the Capitol today was almost certainly also deliberate. The United States after all was different. Thank you. Thank you, Large. So uh, we'll devote the remaining time, which I make to be about 14 minutes to the Q&A. And there is a question which looks like it might be posed particularly to Brian um, in the chat. Brian, can you read that? Or perhaps I should read it aloud. Um, I'll read it aloud and then Brian, perhaps you can have the first crack at it. Um, <clears throat> our questioner asks, I wonder if Brian DeLay or other panelists might have some reflections on how descendants of some of the indigenous polities involved in the conquest have viewed and now view that event. Take Tlaxcala. In the Ayuntamiento of the town, there are murals celebrating Tlaxca ooh, Tlaxcaltecan's role in the fall of Tenochtitlan. But I recently met a young woman working in a Tacoma taqueria who declared that she was ashamed to tell people that she came from Tlaxcala. When I asked her why, she said, we were the traitors. We betrayed Mexico to the Spaniards. 
Do you detect any sort of emerging consensus on this matter in such communities today? Uh, it's a great question, and I won't venture to try to answer the particular question about dissent communities today. I'll ask my uh, esteemed Latin Americanist colleagues to take a crack at that one. But I will just say that I think that this is one of the big tensions, it's sort of a structure agency problem um, that we see in many, many historical topics of consequence. Um, and in, in teaching this material, it's one of the things that I have found uh, students do grapple with is being able to take the 16th, 15th, 16th century uh, on terms as I've described as an international system with, with a bunch of different polities in competition with one another um, and divorce it from the larger, very consequential history of settler colonialism and conquest and imperialism in the Western hemisphere. It's hard to pull those things apart um, in many people's minds. I think Stephanie, Stephanie might be ready to take a crack at this. Um, the slide that I showed where the cacique is hugging Cortez. So I've been, um, I visited that town and I've been working with the young historians there. And um, one of them admitted to me that uh, he was very embarrassed about the alliance with the Spanish in uh, his town's history. Um, but he's also, uh, he also had come to work with um, Luis Reyes Garcia, kind of a Nahuatl seminar. Um, and I think he was finally coming to appreciate more his people's history, his, his people's role and understand it better. But he said, you know, our, our national history, if they, when they teach the, the conquest, you know, they, it's a very black and white um, and inadequate story. So I thought that was really interesting. And it, it pained me to hear him say too, that he was embarrassed um, because there were, you know, there wasn't a, there was very many different polities and they were not all aligned. And, you know, also the way we look at Malinche or Malinsin, I mean, and Cami's work was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, it's far more complex than has been presented to Mexicans in their classrooms, if it's taught at all. But, um, yeah, she, she is like also represented as a Benedict Arnold type of person in Mexican history. And there's, she's, there's much more to the story than, you know. I'll, I'll tag on to what uh, Stephanie has just said. It, it is terribly complex and ever so difficult to, to do a fair job uh, I, I hope that somebody noticed during my presentation, I always referred to it as the invasion of Mexico. Uh, it, the, the C word is one which I tried to uh, take out of my, my mouth because it, it, is, it was a war, it was an invasion. Uh, it was a complex political and social system into which Cortez and his followers went. Uh, they exploited it for their own benefit. Uh, and yes, to this day in Mexico, there are, there are many, many factions uh, who are either ready to embrace one side or embrace another. It, it is, it, it's not resolved at all after 500 years. Let me read another question um, uh, from Laura Matthews to all panelists. Uh, thank you for the stimulating panel. I'm interested in the panelists' experience in U.S. classrooms regionally. Are there typical differences in how this history resonates for Latinx and or indigenous descended students on the East Coast versus the West Coast of the U.S., for example? Um, we only have one West Coast teacher he oh no two we have two I think well on the east coast I will say that it's very illuminating of course here in New York we have we have Latinx students from from throughout both continents uh, we have very large contingent of, of students with Mexican ancestry as well as obviously uh, the Caribbean uh, Puerto Rico and, and Dominican Republic for them it is it's actually quite eye-opening it's something that they'd never heard of it was not it's just not taught uh, to any great degree about the way the Spaniards came in about the way they negotiated uh, or failed to negotiate so the complexity of the situation is just something that they were completely unaware of. And in, and in some ways, uh, a few students have, have mentioned to me, it is empowering uh, to know that it, 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 
yes, maybe some of their descendants had allied themselves with the, with the invaders, but at the same time, there's a certain agency there. So it, it's very complex. I would add on the West Coast, um, we had a question uh, not too long ago in a similar panel to this where a student, uh, a professor said that her students objected to the new conquest history as it's called um, and asked me, you know, how do I deal with that, that among students uh, of like mind here in Oregon? And um, I just also really find that, first of all, people are very glad to know a bit more about the indigenous side of history because it's been so neglected and ignored. Um, and yet they also want to, <laughs> they want to celebrate uh, resistance so, you know, that's why I mentioned the tumultos and, um, and other responses to abuses there. There are a lot of texts in Nahuatl that are very negative towards Spanish colonists in their midst. And I think they really kind of rejoice in seeing that even when the alliances with, you know, and the favoritism um, in, in the way the king is presented, the king of Spain, um, that was mainly because of uh, royal recognition of indigenous communities rights to exist and to have a minimum land base and so on. So there were, you know, they, they begin to see that it, it is more complex and I think they appreciate that, but they still want to kind of revel in the resistance stories. And um, so I, I found that interesting in my students here in the West. Kelly, um, Austin is neither on the West Coast nor the East Coast, but it might have a particularly interesting position from the point of view of this question. Yeah, I agree with Stephanie. A lot of our students really revel in this um, new conquest history in that it's a different version that they were never taught in their uh, grade school through, L uh, through high school experience. Um, Texas history is unusual. We can, we can say in, in what is shared with students and how it is presented. And Texas is also um, home due to generation upon generation of detribalized borderland people, right? Who are who are living this this complicated overlap also of uh, Spain, Mexico, and the United States. Actually, recently I was called about a case that the Isla del Sur Pueblo people have against the city of El Paso, and. What they're, what they're needing to do is to go back to Spanish land grants and then go to Mexican land grants and then go to uh, uh, different, different agreements with the state of Texas. So it's very complicated here. What I do wanna say though, is that Nahuatl is considered by many, many, many of my students to be their heritage language. So not only do we have Spanish language heritage speakers here abundantly, but Nahuatl language uh, speakers that so many recall their grandmothers and even their, their parents speaking Nahuatl and are really excited to take that back. Now, when they find out that there are thousands of manuscript pages in the National Archive of Mexico in their language that they had no idea about, they get awfully excited and really interested in going down that rabbit hole and learning the language and trying to, um, approach their history in a way that they were not allowed to previously. Thanks, Kelly. So um, in the chat, Stephanie, there is a comment um, directed to you. Um, I'll, I'll read it in case um, not everybody can see it. Um, uh, Stephanie, thank you for your presentation, which brings to mind years ago when I attended the Danza de la Pluma in Oaxaca in Teotitlan del Valle and saw how the story of the conquest was enacted in the dance in a way that portrayed the indigenous people as the victors and almost cathartically reversed the impact of the historical Spanish conquest through ritual and performance. It's just a comment, not a question, but maybe Stephanie, you have some comment on the comment. Uh, just thank you for sharing that experience. I, um, as a specialist of Central Mexican uh, ethno history, I um, I still love Oaxaca and what they have been doing in Oaxaca to recast uh, indigenous people in a much more prominent role in history. Uh, I love going to Oaxaca. I love. I used to take 
school teachers there in large groups through NEH. Um, so yeah, that there there also, for instance, in Querétaro, I remember seeing um, you know a parade uh, where the indigenous peoples were celebrated for their role in the conquest, but at the same time, you know, um, embracing, say, the Virgin of Guadalupe, who's a Catholic figure, but of course she has this complicated story that's uh, involved with Juan Diego and Nahua and so on. So anyway, I don't want to go on too long, but um, yeah, I love that. I love the Danza de la Pluma. And here's a new question um, from Onyx Salgado. When teaching U.S. history, mostly general concepts in many schools, is not uh, not to mention uh, Spain and Mexican presence until the 1840s. Um, today, geographically, the U.S. occupies many of these territories. What can be done to illustrate the full history to students today? Go ahead, Lige. So um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, I focus on the first half of the American survey, as my talk suggests. Uh, I, I end with the Civil War, and uh, a major theme, in fact, is that interaction uh, uh, between the United States and its southern neighbor. And uh, I mean, my my scholarship is on the American Revolution, and you you can't understand uh, uh, the the development of the U.S. Constitution without that running conflict and tension and struggle over lands, uh, you know, into, including into Tennessee. I and mean, we don't think of Tennessee as Spanish territory, but I mean, it's, it's Indian country, but, but with Spain as a, a very real presence uh, there uh, um, into the 1790s. So that's one way I, I deal with it. Can I just chime in real quickly to um, uh, echo a little bit what, what Lisha said, but say in teaching, especially on the West Coast, um, I feel also teaching the first half of the U.S. History Survey um, real responsibility to frame the uh, semester in a continental sense, um, because it seems to me that most often U.S. history is taught as process, which is unsaid, but basically it's the process of the expansion of English speaking peoples. And so the frame expands as English speaking dominance expands um, and everything gets left out if you do it that way. So. Um, by beginning with the continent as your unit of analysis, you can take me take seriously not only um, the Spanish uh, activity in North America, but also the history of indigenous peoples. So the other thing that I think is really important in this regard is to leave students even in the basic survey class with a sense of what the Mexican national project was and why the US Mexican war, the, the, the Texas rebellion and the US Mexican war unfolded as it did. Um, and that I think is, is something that, that uh, at least my students really one. Great. Uh, thank you, Brian and Lige. So um, we have come to 3.30 and um, completed our 90 minutes. Um, so I would like to, uh, well, first I ask the panelists if they have, any of them have any last word they would like to contribute before we close our session. Okay, uh, in that case, um, thank you one and all. And um, on behalf of the American Historical Association and the panel, thanks to everyone out there who's uh, listened to us um, this afternoon. And uh, here's Debbie, she might have a closing word. Yes, I'm just going to express my thanks to everyone who joined us today um, and particularly to the panelists. And uh, give one more thanks to our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. So have a great day. Thank you again.